had about 30% of the drainage area in small grains as recently as 1950, and a considerable amount of alfalfa and other hay crops, 35, 40% of the landscape. <clears throat> so we know we can grow these crops here because they've been grown here. As an agronomist, one of the things that's extremely striking is that Data sets from all over the world indicate that crops grown in short rotations or monocultures lose much of their yield potential. There are a variety of reasons for this. Most of them are related to soil factors, soil compaction, soil microbiology, the availability of moisture in soil that is more compact is lower than in soil that has higher organic matter and that has lower bulk density. So <clears throat> for all these major crops in the world, including uh, corn and soybean, uh, short rotations in monocultures mean that farmers are giving up yield potential. So why aren't we continuing to grow corn in short rotations? Why are we growing soybean in short rotations? Well, the system has been pretty well optimized for that. But from an agronomic point of view, the system meaning the processing and distribution sector, the marketing sector, the folks who add value to corn and soybean, that's all been really well optimized. But from an agronomic point of view, I would argue that <clears throat> continuous corn or two years of corn, one year of soy, or an alternate year of corn-soybean rotation may not be giving us the agronomic benefits and meeting the yield potential that um, agronomy would indicate is out there. Okay, so if you live in Iowa, <clears throat> you've heard that we have continuing problems with soil erosion. You've heard a lot about water quality, emissions of nutrients to surface waters has uh, led to the Des Moines Water Works suit. <clears throat> we have herbicide resistant weeds that have become well adapted to Roundup Ready corn and Roundup Ready soybean grown continuously, one after another. We have new crop diseases showing up like sudden death syndrome and soybean. There's been a lot of economic volatility. We've had seven or eight dollar corn. Now we're down to what three, three twenty-five, something like that. But input costs have not necessarily dropped as fast as crop prices, and that means people are caught in a squeeze. And that kind of volatility is a, a different or a difficult environment in which to plan um, long-term profitable scenarios. I think. The other thing that's going on with uh, heavy emphasis on corn and soy is we've seen reductions in wildlife populations and reductions in populations of uh, bees, monarch butterflies, and um, that's of continuing concern to many people. All right, so what I want to talk about is how diversifying corn and soy systems might reduce requirements for purchased inputs like fertilizers, pesticides, fuel, how it can maintain or improve productivity and profitability with lower levels of purchased inputs, how it can reduce susceptibility to certain crop diseases, and how we can improve the environmental performance characteristics of our cropping systems just by increasing the level of diversity that we have on the land. So I'm going to talk about an experiment that's been running um, west of town here in Boone County <clears throat> at the uh, university's Marsden farm. And the experiment involves a conventionally managed cash grain system, corn, soy, and alternate years, as well as three and four year rotations that add oats and red clover in the case of the three year system and oats and alfalfa in the case of the four year system. <clears throat> so there are 36 plots out there. They're 60 feet wide and 275 feet long. That allows us to use what I'll call medium scale farm equipment. Typically we're using six and 12 row equipment. <clears throat> each phase of each rotation system is present every year and I'll show you what that means. From a statistical point of view, it means you didn't grow the corn in the wet year and the soybean in the dry year. You've got both corn and 
soybean present every year. You've got oats present every year where you're growing it in the rotation. You've got hay present every year. We started in 2001 making measurements on the field. We grew oats over the whole area. We ran a yield monitor over it. We did a lot of soil sampling to look at the fertility characteristics because it's about 22 acres out there and we wanted to arrange the plots in such a way that we covered all the variability in weeds and soil characteristics. All right, so starting in 2003 through 2005, we had what I'll call the startup period where we were kind of burning in the rotations. And between 2006 and the present, um, I'll say it's a more mature period for the experiment. All right, so I mentioned before that we've got each crop present every year and the location of each crop changes from year to year. So if you go from year one to year two, if corn is yellow and soybean is green, you see they flip back and forth where they are on the land. And <coughs> oats there are represented in purple and alfalfa is represented in blue. And you can see that they move around. But in any one year, we have every phase of each cropping system present on the whole field. And that's really important because when you want to do things like doing uh, economic budgets, um, you're interested in not just the returns for each individual crop phase, but for this one unit of land that you've split between two crops or three crops or four crops, what's the return per unit of land, right? Because obviously it's a system. And if you're growing half as much corn in a four-year rotation as you are in a two-year rotation, you want to know how much money you're making in a given year for a given unit of land that's distributed differently among those different crops. So that's how we do the economics. We build individual crop enterprise budgets, but then we build them for the system as a whole. And I'll be sharing some of that with you for oats and for other crops in the rotation and for the system as a whole. All right, so <clears throat> in these three, in these four-year systems where we're growing forages or we're integrating the system with livestock, we are looking at the harvest of alfalfa hay, say, and we're looking at the return of manure. And although we don't have animals on this farm, we get it from another farm, and we calculate the amount of manure that would be generated by the number of animals that we could support given the concentrates and forages that we can produce on the land unit that we're going to put the manure on. And as it turns out, we're actually using a little bit less manure back onto the land than we could generate given the amount of concentrates and forage production. So we're not subsidizing these three and four year systems with artificial high rates of manure. We're trying to balance the system between what we generate in the crop portion and what we return in the manure portion. <clears throat> so for us, we're um, adding seven tons on a fresh weight basis of composted manure once every three years in the three-year rotation preceding corn, once every four years in the four-year rotation preceding corn. And that's <clears throat> a way of returning quite a bit of phosphorus and potassium, particularly where we're hauling it off in the forage in large quantities. Alfalfa hay is a great way to export P and K off your farm, so you have to put something back. We use some mineral fertilizer, but we get a lot of P and K out of the manure we return. <clears throat> this system is not organic in any way. We use some herbicide, we use some fertilizer, but we soil test and we tissue test so that uh, the amount that we add as mineral fertilizer is uh, pretty low. And I'll show you those numbers in a minute. In our two year system, we put 100 pounds of nitrogen down at planting when corn goes in. And then we come back and we test the soil when the corn's about 6 to 12 inches tall. And we side dress urea ammonium nitrate liquid depending on what that soil test is. For our three and our four year systems, we take credit for the legume plow down. The alfalfa and the red clover are adding considerable amounts of nitrogen. We take credit for some of the nitrogen in the manure that's being released as it decomposes. We don't put any nitrogen fertilizer down at planting, but we do do a soil test when the corn is 6 to 12 inches tall. And we side dress with urea ammonium nitrate 
if the soil test indicates we need more to hit a high level of yield. Tillage. We moldboard plow the alfalfa in November, in the year preceding corn, and we moldboard plow red clover in November, in the year preceding corn, in the three-year rotation. So these systems do use moldboard plowing, but we only do it once every three years or once every four years. This is relatively level ground. It has about a 1% or 2% slope. If I were on 6 to 10% slopes, I would not be moldboard plowing much of the area. Okay? But for our area, <clears throat> turning the ground, leaving it rough, and then harrowing it before we plant corn uh, works well. These soils are not pattern tiled. And they are relatively tight and relatively cold and wet in the spring if we don't plow. So there are some advantages that we've tested explicitly, fall plowing versus spring plowing. And we do better with fall plowing because it typically is drier and the soil is in better condition when we go to plant corn. All right, management practices for oat. And we can talk more about this in detail, but I just lay out all my cards on the table so you see what we do. <clears throat> We're following soybean and we'll disc or field cultivate it to work up a seed bed for oats. I'm a very strong believer that it is important to cultivate ground before you plant. If it's too dry and it gets fluffy, you don't have good depth control when you put the seed in the ground for the oats or corn. So <clears throat> after this ground has been cultivated, it's cultipacked. And then we plant into that. It's a firm seed bed, and we've knocked out any early germinating weeds. We use uh, this cultivar. I've been buying it in Iowa. It's from Indiana. Performs well for us. I'm not going to tell you it's the best cultivar, but it performs well for us. We uh, sow it with a drill in seven and a half inch rows. We plant it at 80 pounds an acre, which is about, I think, two and a half bushels. We plant it with red clover at 12 pounds an acre or with alfalfa at 15 pounds an acre. We have a grass clover box on the back of the drill. It puts the seed down in the same drill row that the oat seed goes down in, a little bit higher, closer to the soil surface than the oat seed. <clears throat> we count every year what the emerged density of oat is, as well as legumes. We get an average of 22 seedlings of oats per square foot, and that's been very consistent year to year. One or two years, we've seen something a little bit different than that, but um, we hit this very consistently, and I'll show you what it looks like in the field. It seems to work well, both in terms of grain yield and as uh, a population of oat that is pretty um, forgiving to the underseeded legumes. All right, uh, the grain is harvested in mid-July with a uh, combine. So we don't swath, we direct cut. And then uh, the straw is raked and baled within two days of the grain harvest. Um, I like to look at the field and almost always like to have it mowed five or six weeks after the grain harvest to clip the weeds. If I think that the uh, alfalfa crop will... Um, produce a good yield because we had enough moisture. Uh, if we can get a good cutting in the first week of September, sometimes the alfalfa seeding with the oats is not uh, clipped. And we just take uh, what weeds are growing with the cut of hay in uh, the first couple days of September. But for red clover, we're, uh, we're growing it for green manure purposes. Uh, clipping it is a very effective way to keep down things like uh, water hemp and it won't kill lamb's quarters. It, uh, lamb's quarters will uh, come up from the basal stems, but it'll um, do a good job reducing the amount of seed it can produce and give the red clover a head start in a reasonably wet summer. All right. So that's, that's the basics of how we manage our oats. I don't think there's anything particularly different from what grain production in, in the northeastern United States looks like with that. Okay, one thing that um, I will call your attention to is uh, 
something that was discussed before. Roundup is uh, very benevolent with regard to what you seed after it. It doesn't have soil residual activity. As people are becoming more concerned about glyphosate resistance in weeds, they're beginning to tank mix glyphosate with other products, or they're using other products in place of glyphosate. Some of those materials have long residual times that do not work well for oat or forage legume production. So I'm not <clears throat> singling out these as any kind of bad actors. I'm just calling your attention to the fact that whatever chemical practices you may be following with your oats and your forage legumes, you need to look at the label for the rotation restriction, the plant back time. Some of these have fairly long plant back times. And you know, whether they're immediately toxic to oats or not, I can't tell you, but I think the potential is there, particularly if you don't have a lot of rainfall. So if you're coming out of soybean and it's been relatively dry and you've had relatively poor conditions for herbicide degradation, you could be getting into some residual issues here, okay? So <clears throat> just a word to the wise, look at the labels. Know what you're dealing with before you start uh, putting a lot of effort into small grains. Make sure your previous weed control practices are compatible with that. Okay, another thing I can tell you is that um, harrow to produce a seed bed for your small grain crop, oats or any other, as close to the time that you're gonna plant as possible. So these are data from Sweden and what this is telling you is that if your weeds have a head start on your crop, you're going to be sorry. And I can tell you that lamb's quarters germinates at a temperature that oats will germinate at. Okay, so if your lamb's quarters is growing in that seven to ten days that you harrowed back then, and that lamb's quarters is growing and you don't see much, right? But then you put your oat crop in, you're gonna be sorry. Okay, because it has a tremendous head start. And growth is a, in biological terms, a geometric process. You can think of it in terms of your bank account that if you get a 10% daily compounded interest rate, like many small weeds are going like gangbusters, they start out very small from small seeds, but that rate of increase is going really quick. <clears throat> Even though your oats start out looking pretty good, the weeds will take them. Margaret. If you expect the same weed time for winter annuals that are already germinated, what's the difference between the lamb's quarters? Yeah, winter annuals are even worse because they're already set up with a big root system. So you need a clean seed bed, right? And you can do that a variety of ways, but um, if you're gonna do it mechanically, make sure you harrow the ground as close to the time you plant the crop as possible. Otherwise, cool tolerant weeds like lamb's quarters and <coughs> giant ragweed will eat your oat crop, okay? Yeah. Is that based on uh, four label grade study? Yes. Yeah. So I'm just reading what's in this weed control guide for Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. It's like a standard agronomy grind. And um, I mean, I, I can dig it out for labels when I consider my options. When I build a crop rotation, I'm very cognizant of carryover now. When it was all glyphosate, that wasn't an issue but it's not all glyphosate anymore. All right, so <clears throat> here we are drilling. This past year, 31st of March, we try to get out as early as possible. We're not on a tile-drained field. There's a little bit of tile in a couple of areas that are particularly wet, but it's not patterned tile. But if you watch the weather, you often get a period of time when the ground is thawed, it's drained, and you're not getting a lot of rain. And obviously in Iowa, we get more rain as you get farther into April and into May. It gets harder and harder. So it's not just a question of um, <clears throat> planting early because 
you want to get a high grain yield because it has a more uh, better development period is that as you wait longer and longer, the number of field days you've got available become fewer and fewer. All right, so this is the 16th of April, and you can see we've got our grain emerging in the same row that we've got our clover seed coming up in. All right, yeah? How deep do you plant those? An inch, inch and a quarter at most. And the uh, seed drop tubes for the forage legumes probably put it down to a quarter inch or three-eighths of an inch. And then it's, uh, they're packing wheels on top of that. Some people would roll the field afterward. If I've cultivated it, uh, early enough, um, I don't do that. It's, it's firm enough that it'll work. All right, so here it is, 23rd of April. This is a couple years ago, but you can see that you're beginning to get quite a bit of uh, growth, even early on. This is the 14th of May, and you have almost complete soil cover. You're seeing flowering activity in early June, if you're planted early. And we're typically harvesting between the 10th and the 23rd of July. All right, so what have our yields been? Um, I want to make sure that I have incorporated that seed into the ground. So if I'm going to put the clover broadcast, I would probably do it with a brilliant type seeder. That would be another field operation, right? So there's more machinery and expense associated with that. As you'll see, I think you get a pretty good catch of clover if you plant it early and there's enough moisture, even though it's spaced seven and a half inches apart. So you could broadcast it. My concern about broadcasting it is much of that seed will um, shrivel and die after it's imbibed on the soil surface. I want to make sure that I get as many plants there as possible that have good soil seed contact. That's my rationale anyway. But I'm not going to tell you that it won't work to go the other way. OK, so um, one of the things we see is that there is a little bit of competition from the red clover. We're planting it at the same time. The red clover produces more growth. It's a little bit more aggressive against the oats than the alfalfa seems to be. On the other hand, for a one season growth, plow down kind of situation, um, red clover is a good crop. And I'm willing to give up a couple of bushels of oats for the amount of nitrogen that I fix in the uh, associated red clover. So our average is uh, in the mid 90s. Our test weights have run 33 to 38. We don't do anything special. We don't clean them any special way. Um, the average test weight has been 35 pounds. Maybe we could bring that up with a different variety or a different type of cleaning, but we haven't tried to do that. OK, <clears throat> you can see the uh, variability in oat yields here. 2013, we had a very uh, severe wind and hail storm. And uh, it occurred the night before we were planning to harvest the oats. It was very unfortunate. <clears throat> so we were down in the high 30s. But we've been as high as 135. Our average is here in the 90s. It's been pretty consistent. All right, so this is after harvest. The straw has been baled. The red clover is beginning to grow in the stubble. Alfalfa does the same. <clears throat> Here's clipping it mid-August, about a month after uh, the grain has been removed and the straw has been baled. This is just a corn flail. And here's mid-September, and you can see that red clover crop has uh, come in really well. It's got good ground cover, excellent weed control. I'm not saying there are no weeds there, but it's pretty good. Yeah. A uh, couple inches, yeah, Just like four inches. Right, but clover is pretty tolerant of, of clipping. You don't want to go, you know, right down to the ground level, but you can take quite a bit of clipping. Yeah, and you know, we do the same in the alfalfa if I see a considerable amount of weeds. But if I'm 
confident that we have enough moisture that we can get one cut of alfalfa, we can get three quarters of a ton of alfalfa hay in the first week of September. All right, so um, <clears throat> nitrogen is a consideration when you build the rotation with this small grain legume underseeding kind of situation. So um, we've measured the amount of nitrogen in the shoots of alfalfa <coughs> in the hay year preceding corn and in the red clover that was interseeded with oats that's going to go to corn the following year. And you can see that there's a lot. So this alfalfa has been cut three to five times. So there's not a lot of plow down material in the shoots. There is a pretty large amount in the root system of second year alfalfa. This is first year seeded red clover. There's a lot in the shoots. There's some in the roots. And uh, when you incorporate that material into the soil, that's a pretty sizable nitrogen credit for your subsequent corn crop. It's not enough necessarily to make all of the yield, but we're adding some manure. And as I'll show you in a minute, we're often able to get away with not adding any fertilizer at all. In the composted manure, at the rate we're applying it, we're adding about 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. It's slow release. Not all of it will be available to next year's corn crop, but we're building our soil bank of fertility. All right, so <clears throat> between 2006 and 2015, given that fertility regime, we've reduced our mineral nitrogen fertilizer use about 90%. This <clears throat> two pounds per acre represents the nitrogen present in diammonium or monoammonium phosphate. So we're adding a little bit of nitrogen there every so often when we top off the P and the K. But most of the nitrogen <clears throat> that we're using in this experiment is going into corn in the two-year system. And the average across wet years and dry years for the amount of nitrogen we're adding as urea ammonium nitrate side dress is about, I'll say, 22 pounds an acre for the three and the four year rotations. So we're getting a big boost out of the nitrogen in the clover that was interseeded with the oats or the alfalfa that was grown as a hay crop after being seeded the previous year with the oats and some of the manure. All right, here are corn yields. So despite using 90% less mineral fertilizer, our corn yields are a bit higher, about 4 or 5% higher. Because we have these long strip plots, we can measure yield 275 feet, six rows down the field. And those yield differences between the three and the four year corn and the two year corn are actually statistically significant. No difference between the three and the four year corn, but <clears throat> we're using less fertilizer and we're getting higher yields. So I like oats as a nurse crop for red clover and for alfalfa. What about disease? In particular, what about soybean diseases? So <clears throat> over the period of time since 2010, we've seen that sudden death syndrome caused by a fungus called Fusarium vergiliformi, which is soil borne, has attacked soybean in some years fairly viciously. And in 2010, because it was cold and wet early in the season, yield losses to this disease were large. But we've continued to see it in other years. It may not be as dramatic as what we saw in 2010, but um, it's around. And I've been working with a group of plant pathologists to track the incidence and severity of this disease and look at what it does to soybeans. So it's favored by cool, wet weather, and it's soil borne. Okay? And the way the fungus works is it injects a toxin into the soybean roots that moves into the shoots, and you get this kind of necrosis and leaf loss. You get less photosynthesis, <coughs> and you lose a lot of yield. So in 2010, <clears throat> without planning to investigate this disease, I walked out to these plots where the three-year rotation was next door to the two-year rotation, row to row, 275 feet long. And all these plots were <clears throat> losing their leaves. The leaves were dying, falling off. And all these plots on the other side of this field edge here, plot edge here, 
were much greener and they looked really healthy. And I said, hmm, this is kind of dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> so I jumped up and down and called my friends in the plant pathology department and then they went, wow, this is kind of dramatic. <laughs> and it was every plot, right? It wasn't just this one pair. It was, you know, we have these plots replicated four times around this 22 acre set of plots and they all look like this. So <clears throat> they got interested. We got some money from the Iowa Soybean Association. We started digging around in the soil, looking at the roots, culturing the microbes in the soil. We still don't have the soil microbiology situation completely worked out, but <laughs> it's interesting. And what you see is that the incidence and the severity go down as the rotation length goes up. Okay, so incidence are how many plants of the total soybean population are affected? Severity is of the ones that are affected, how bad is it? Okay? And <clears throat> these are kind of standard ways that plant pathologists rate disease problems. Okay, so remember that soybean in each of these systems follows corn. In each system. So the preceding crop was the same in all of these rotations. Before corn, we either had alfalfa in the four-year system or we had the oats and red clover in the three-year system, right? So the preceding crop was the same. So something broke the disease cycle or something interfered with the biology of the pathogen, right? Corn, as it turns out, is a alternate host for Fusarium virgiliforme. So it's that break crop. It's the oats and the legumes that are interfering with the disease cycle. So it could be that the pathogen is being outcompeted in the soil, or it could be being attacked by microbes that feed on it. Okay? So we're working on that and trying to look at the balance of microbes in the soil to try to determine how we're getting a shift that's suppressing either the population density or the ability to infect soybean by the pathogen when we put oats and legumes into the system. But it's a very interesting story and it translates into fairly large differences in yield. Okay, so this is averaged over 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 8 years and we've know, we know we've been measuring the pathogen since 2010 and it's probably been around since before that. And you can see that there's a 10 bushel per acre increase here, just as a function of the rotation. On average, in some years, it's more dramatic than that. Okay, so that's like 22% increase in yield, something like that, just as a function of rotation. So yes, we're growing lower value oats in a rotation, but we're getting higher yields of corn and soybean with less fertilizer input. And as I'll show you in a minute, that translates out into a reduction in production costs, increase in crop value, and it makes the rotation economics kind of favorable, even though you're growing a crop like oats that has a relatively low value. Okay, so when we do the economics, <clears throat> I assemble a log of all the field operations and all the machinery that we've used all the chemicals we've applied, the amount of manure we've applied, what we apply everything with, and I hand it off to Ann Johans, who builds the extension enterprise budgets for crops in this state. And if you use the Ag Decision Maker page, you're working with her um, spreadsheets. Okay? <clears throat> we work with labor costs that are associated with the machinery, coverage of the field, how many acres can we cover per hour given the size of the machinery that we're using. So we include labor costs for all the machinery operations. <clears throat> and we include a cost for manure, but not for the material itself. So one of the fundamental assumptions for what I'm going to show you is that we have to pay to handle the manure, to, to pick it up and spread it. But we're not paying for the material itself. We have done analyses 
sort of worst case scenarios if you had to purchase that manure at the same cost as you would spend for mineral fertilizer. And we can talk about that if you want to see what that does to the economics. But I'm assuming in these analyses that either you have a livestock operation on your own farm or you're working with a farmer who needs to move manure and <clears throat> you're going to close that cycle, either in your neighborhood or on your farm. Okay, so <clears throat> here's a note budget just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And included in this is a land cost. If you own your own land cost, you're going to pay taxes on it, but you don't have the rental fee, okay? This would be as if you were renting the land. So this bottom line is net returns to management. So you've subtracted the land cost, you've subtracted the labor cost, you've subtracted all the chemicals, you've subtracted all the field operations, and it's negative. If you owned your land, it would be positive, okay? But <clears throat> what happens in the corn phase gets interesting. It's a system. Fertilizer use goes down because you've got those legumes in that system. So the corn it yields a little bit more and the production costs are lower and you come out ahead in terms of returns to management when corn is in those three and the four year systems relative to the conventional corn soybean system. Okay, So the revenue <coughs> is high in that corn system because our yields are good. Our production costs are lower a little bit when we've reduced our fertilizer use, right? And you come out ahead in the three and the four year rotation. Now you're growing corn less frequently. In the four year rotation, it shows up one year out of four rather than two years out of four. So we're interested in the overall budget. So here's the two year system over all the crops, the three year system over all the crops, and the four year system over all the crops. Production costs are higher in that corn soybean system than it is in the three and the four year systems. Revenue is higher in the two year system, but when you look at the net returns, you're coming out a little bit ahead in the three and the four year system because you've <coughs> decreased the production costs and you've done a pretty good job maintaining revenue. Okay, the revenue is lower, but the reduction in production costs is greater, and therefore, returns to management are a little bit higher. Statistically, you don't come out ahead. They're all, the three systems are awash, right? But the important thing to understand here is that managing your production costs can be an effective way to maintain profitability, as you would expect. It's not all about how much gross revenue can we generate. If you want to go after gross revenue, this is your system, okay? But if you're interested in that cost-price difference, <clears throat> you've got some things to do here that can be quite profitable. All right, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about the environmental impacts. So I work with a group of engineers at the University of Minnesota that assess these systems for a whole bunch of environmental impacts. One of them is how much fossil energy do we consume? And in our crop systems here in Iowa, the major consumers of fossil fuel energy are fertilizer, natural gas to dry grain, and fuel to run equipment. Okay, and there's more than a 50% reduction in the amount of fossil energy consumed when we move to these three and four year systems. Okay, so if fossil energy prices go back up, <coughs> these systems are less vulnerable to variation in energy costs. Okay? Right now, energy costs are relatively low. Several years ago, they weren't so low. <clears throat> One of the things we've done is looked at soil in these systems. So these were all taken out of corn, which is present in all three systems. And you can see this is the two-year system. It has kind of this blocky structure. The three and the four-year system have a much more friable texture. And bulk density, which is a measure of air in the soil, is lower in the three and the four year system shown in the blue and the purple bars 
than in the two-year system shown in the orange bars. Okay, so bulk density, if it's high, means your soil is more compact, there's less airspace, and the ease with which roots can move through the soil may be reduced. So uh, we have lower soil bulk, bulk density in the three and the four-year rotations, indicating that the soil is in better physical condition, it's in better tilth. Okay, we look at some other soil indicators within these rotations. So particular organic matter carbon is the fraction of organic matter that responds most quickly to reductions in tillage, increases in the amount of organic matter amendments and crop residues that are added to the soil. And they're statistically higher in the three and the four year system than they are in the two year system. So this is the fraction of organic matter that holds together mineral particles and gives you the little crumbs of soil that form that um, more granular structure that provide good tilth, that give that soil a feeling of softness. And um, uh, it's the opposite of sort of blocky, hard, concrete-like structure. This is the glue that brings those soil mineral particles together and gives you good aggregation. Microbial biomass carbon is an indicator of the amount of, <coughs> well, what it says, life in the soil, right? That's not the earthworms, not the burrowing animals, but the microbial fraction, and it's higher. You have more life in the soil where you're adding more amendments, and you have these longer rotations that have more root matter. And finally, uh, one indicator we use of the nitrogen supplying power of the soil, independent of the fertilizer that we add, is what we call potentially mineralizable nitrogen, which is an assay you do in the lab. You bring it in, you put it under standard temperature and moisture conditions, and you measure the amount of mineral plant available nitrogen released in a given number of days from the organic matter. Right? So where you have higher PMN, that means that the soil has the ability to supply more nitrogen to a crop like corn, which is really important if you want to maintain a green canopy late in the season. Right? That stay green effect that you see in some kinds of soils under some kinds of management means that you're feeding the soil later in the season from the inherent organic matter. So we like that. All right. One of the things you see when you put small grains into your rotation is that you get a lot of cover in this early portion of the season when corn and soybean are just setting up. So this is a surrogate for cover. It's light interception. How much light from sky level makes it down to the soil surface? And where light interception is high, like here or here in alfalfa, Right? Most of that light is being intercepted. <clears throat> Why does the alfalfa go up and down like saw teeth? Because we cut it. Right? And you can see that really clearly. Okay. So <clears throat> why does this go up after dropping in uh, July a little bit? This is where the uh, red clover and the alfalfa regrow. Right? This is where we took a cut of alfalfa. All right, but this early period in the year is where we get all of our rainfall and a lot of the erosion occurs. So we get 60% soil cover in the middle of May when we have the small grains. We have about 10% soil cover middle of May in corn and soybean. Okay, so that turns into <coughs> something you can work with if you want to estimate soil erosion. I work with folks at the USDA lab here, National Ag Lab for Ag and Environment used to be called the Soil Tilth Lab. And uh, I work with a very talented um, guy named David James who looks at the soil erosion potential under these different cropping systems on this given piece of land. So we have a digital elevation model map, which <coughs> you do with LIDAR. And you can tell that this northwest corner of the field is 10 feet higher than this southeast corner of the field. You can look at the soil types. You can look at the elevation change, and you can plot flow paths for water. And from that, you can plug in the uh, different crop systems. 
with the amount of cover that they have at different times a year and the tillage operations that are associated with them. And you can calculate using the revised universal soil loss equation the what's called sheet and rill erosion. So this is not ephemeral gully erosion, which could be important in Iowa, but it does look at how much soil would be moved within a field due to the surface flow. And you can see that even though this is a relatively flat field, we can get a 21 or 35 percent reduction even though we moldboard plow by having small grains and forage legumes in the rotation. Now, if I was a complete no-till person, that would be even better right? in terms of less erosion potential. But what I want to tell you here is that on ground that could be moldboard plow without a big erosion potential, um, this reduction is significant in terms of <clears throat> what we can see with regard to protecting the soil, longer rotations with small grains and forage legumes can be useful. All right, the final thing I want to talk about relates to nitrate in drainage water. So these plots have been instrumented with lysimeter cups that allow us to look at <clears throat> the concentration of nitrate in soil water moving below the root zone of the crops. Okay, so this is kind of a big deal in Iowa now if you're following what's going on in Des Moines because that water ultimately is going to move to surface water channels and um, could be a problem for drinking water. So what I want to highlight here is that these small grain plots in the uh, three and the four year system, early in the spring, the concentrations of nitrogen relative to corn and soybean are not particularly reduced because the plants are very small, they don't have a big root system. But by midsummer, <clears throat> if you compare that to corn, these nitrate levels in corn and soybean are much higher than what you're seeing in the small grains. And in the fall, particularly if you have a wet fall and the soil is mineralizing a lot or the crop didn't use all the nitrate, nitrogen that was applied, <clears throat> you get big reductions in the fall as well as the summer. And of course, alfalfa, which has deep roots and uh, you're not adding fertilizer to it anyway, um, dramatically reduces the amount of nitrate in the drainage water. So from the standpoint of managing nitrogen, small grains are a good deal. If I were growing winter wheat in this system, these early spring levels would probably be very low as well because I would have a well-established root system and it would be sucking up all those nitro nitrogen molecules that are moving in the drainage water. So um, folks at the ARS lab here have shown about a 60% reduction in nitrate concentrations in drainage water when you use fall cereals. So from the standpoint of managing nutrients, this is a good deal. From the standpoint of reducing runoff and erosion, small grains underseeding with forage legumes is a good deal. All right, so <clears throat> what I see from having done these experiments is that profitability is about the same. The environmental performance is improved. The opportunities for weed control with uh, something other than continuous glyphosate are good. And um, I think it's a good way to consider protecting your soil and protecting water quality. You do need some skills and marketing channels that we uh, may not have in abundance in Iowa right now. But I think if people work together with the marketing stream and we develop the knowledge base and the equipment familiarity, we can get this done. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Matt. We have uh, plenty of time for questions, so we'll get it going here. Did you notice a difference in how the corn looked, like the soybean picture that you showed? Did well, the corn, corn look stays different? greener longer in the season. Is that I mean, lack of Gus's wilt? or? No, I, th I think it's that the nitrogen supplying power of the soil is improved. The other thing we see is early in the season, <clears throat> the corn is taller. The leaves are larger, the stem is thicker uh, in the three and the four year rotations even before we side dress nitrogen. So we're clearly getting enough nitrogen to the crop early on. And you know we've done some measurements of root development and the root systems of these corn plants in the three and the four year rotations are better. I, I don't know if that's because the physical structure of the soil has been improved 
or there's some other effect going on. But it's very striking. You walk out, actually for soybean too, and you can tell the plots that are in the longer rotations because the plants look healthier. Do we need people just to eat more meat, or do we need to drag the cows back from wherever in the west and southwest they are back to Iowa? to make all this happen? I think the best thing for water quality in Iowa would be to increase the number of cows. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. I mean, where you have more grass, you hold onto the soil, there's less erosion, smaller quantities of nutrients are moving in runoff, and you have deep roots and continuous living cover throughout the year. So, I mean, I, I don't think that... Um, Enough attention has been given to the importance of bringing back cattle for dairy or beef in Iowa with regard to water quality and soil protection. So does yeah. that mean that we have to reduce synthetic fertilizers? Because synthetic fertilizers took over in 1942 when we used to farm like we just discussed, but then all of a sudden it doesn't, that didn't make sense because fertilizer was cheap. Reduce, reduce okay, the, the, the comment was that um, we would probably be using a lot less fertilizer if we brought back livestock, and fertilizer sales would go down. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, this isn't, this isn't anything other than basic agronomic principles put to work. I mean, I, as I tried to show you before, we used to grow these crops in Iowa, and we had a high proportion of our farms that had livestock integrated into the rotation system. And I, I think that, uh, you know, many people in this room already know that from practical experience. I didn't make these systems up. The first summer I moved here, I uh, visited with Dick Thompson. I used to ride in the tractor with him while he'd be doing farm chores and cultivating. And he explained, you know, why he did what he did. And he was very free with the information. And I figured what I could do would be make some detailed observations and measurements to try to look at the details. But, you know, the basic agronomy is something that farmers have been well acquainted with for a long time. Question on your, uh, your alfalfa and your red clover. You tilled that in in November, is that right? You fall yeah, we, you know, we, we play it a little bit dangerously with regard to the weather. I don't want to do plowing any earlier than necessary, and sometimes, well, you saw there was some snow in that picture. Do you think if you were doing that in the spring, like even late spring, mid-spring, uh, would that slow down the release of that nitrogen? Um, so my concern on this particular site is that when we spring plow in a wet year, we wind up with slabs. And um, I don't know if the mineralization of the clover and the alfalfa would be significantly delayed, but I know that the soil structure in many years would be damaged. And um, I don't think this is an ideal system, but I have sort of made a compromise given the soil characteristics that we have on this site. I mean, Thompson fall plowed. He had a big Kernland plow, if any of you remember from the field days. And he plowed deeper than we plow. Um, he called it an inversion plow. It's, uh, I think, in Danish import, right? And it was, I think he was plowing to like 16 inches, 14, 16 inches. Uh, about 10 inches. Tom, I'll get to you right next. I was, is it even on? I was wondering if you had seen a difference in how um, they responded to a flood or drought. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, have you seen a difference in how they, they, the response to flood or drought, depending on the location they're in? How the different crops flood or, flood or drought? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, okay, so <clears throat> we've been on this site. Since 2001, we got through the drought of 2012. We had a hail and windstorm in 2013. We had massive flooding in 2008. We had bad flooding in 2010. So one of the things we've looked at is the variation in net returns. And it's lower in the three and the four year rotation relative to the two year rotation. 2012, when we had that drought, we got five cuts of Alfalfa hay, we had our highest alfalfa years. We had good moisture storage. Every day was a good day to make hay. 
<laughs> so, you know, that was our most profitable crop in that year. In 2013, when we had really bad hail, and I told you it knocked down the oats, but it flattened, we, we had wind with that hail, it flattened the corn, corn gooseneck back up, we did get some yield out of it. Soybeans probably lost 90% of their leaves. Yield went way down. We also had uh, a rather unfortunate dicamba drift from a neighboring field. The two things together. Okay, so the alfalfa did fine. We got four cuts of alfalfa hay. So I think there is a, um, it's like an investment portfolio, right? You spread your bets across more different crops. Yes, it does require um, more management. It takes more labor. Uh, you're working in the times of year, typically, that don't conflict with corn and soybean except for the first cut of hay. But, you know, midsummer to take off small grains, that's not in conflict with your corn and soybean. Spreading manure in the fall, you know, you can work that around corn and soybean harvest. Um, cultivating, if you want to do that, um, you know, maybe there's a little bit of conflict there. Okay, we go to Tom, then Doug, then George. It's really interesting that there's no subsurface drainage lines in these plots, and yet much of Iowa is now in the subsurface drain. It's intensely subsurface drain. Yeah, I work which, on other sites that have. Which is close as 30 feet apart tile lines, even yeah. as shallow as three feet deep. Yeah. So what's your response to the effect that your research shows in an agriculture that really is radically altered with all this drainage? So we've done two things in Iowa since European settlement. We've completely altered the vegetation. Iowa has the lowest amount of native vegetation proportionally of any state in the country. And we've replumbed it with, you know, a million miles of tile. So water that used to move, what they call green water, through the plants to enter the sky, right? Got pulled up by the roots, or would sit in these little prairie potholes and slowly evaporate, now gets moved very quickly out these tiles. So <clears throat> Nitrogen is dissolved in the water. Other things are dissolved in the water. If you don't intercept that water before it moves into surface water channels that ultimately move into creeks and rivers, you're going to move sizable amounts of nitrogen and some pesticides with the drainage water. So you can build um, retention ponds at the discharge end of a tile line and allow much of that nitrogen to move back to the sky as nitrogen gas, and you can lose a lot of the toxicity of the pesticides. So, I mean, you can build lateral buffers where you run uh, tile laterally through uh, prairie vegetation, shrubs, and trees before it bleeds into a drainage ditch or a stream. And you can clean the water up. But if you allow a tile to discharge directly into a surface water channel without being filtered or allowed to uh, be altered by biological and physical and chemical processes, it's going to carry things with it. And, you know, to the extent that, l let me say one other thing. So um, I showed a slide of the decrease in the small grain acreage and hay acreage in the Raccoon River Basin, which is the Des Moines Water Works drying area. So <clears throat> it turns out that as a function of losing those crops in the landscape, like 60% of the landscape had been in hay and small grains, you've lost the ability to pull water from the soil that would normally be draining if corn and soybean were there. So where small grains and hay crops are present in the spring and in the fall, more water moves up to the sky through the root system, and less of it moves in the drainage. So one of the reasons you have a lot more nutrients moving below corn and soybean fields is that during much of the year when soil organic matter is mineralizing, <coughs> crops are not taking up that nitrogen. And it's leaching through the soil. And where you put small grains and hay crops into the landscape, more of the water moves to the sky, less of it moves in drainage. And the reduction in drainage water volume moving ultimately into surface water channels means that you're moving a whole lot less nutrients and to a certain extent less pesticides. So if we want to solve the water quality problem in Iowa, in my humble opinion, it's a question of vegetation management, which implies water management. We need more 
living roots at depth. We need more continuous living cover, and we need to address the movement of water <clears throat> and intercept it before it goes into the surface water channels. Small grains, forage crops, pasture are the way to do that, as well as some things like riparian buffers, lateral buffers, stormwater retention ponds, all that kind of stuff. It all works. Comment on um, mulberd plowing in the spring. Where we live, we're not as flat. So one, a landlord of ours wrote in the lease, no fall plowing. So that forced me to learn how. Um, 25 years ago when we started this plowing, in, we'd put in the small grains, get that done, then we would start plowing for row crops. We would plow half a day and then immediately go over it with a cultivulture to prevent the slabbing. Worked reasonably well. Fast forward 25 years, we now plow, and if we cultivulture between two and four days later, not a problem. It's that difference in soil structure. So our standard protocol is moldboard plow as soon as we can, cultivulture, leave it until corn planting time, hit it with the field cultivator and plant. Slabbing is hasn't been an issue for us for years in spring plowing. Um, this year was not an ideal spring for spring plowing. I just looked at our plot work. We plowed on May 8th. That's a month later than I want to. Planted May 22nd. Yield was 197. Good deal. I, I, I want to be clear that I'm not recommending that everybody follow what I just described, okay? So this is my experience. It's certainly not perfect. Yeah. No, I mean, we, we did several years of measurements on this site comparing corn yields and soil physical structure with fall versus spring plowing. And all I can say on this site, maybe it was just a function of the years we tested it, is that we did a lot better with fall plowing. And, you know, I would, I would be willing to concede that I'm making a poor choice were it not for Dick Thompson said, yeah, I fall plow because I'm, and his farm was four sections north of where I am. You know, he fall plowed because on that particular farm, it fit. And he would not be a person who would have said, this is perfect either. It was his compromise. And, you know, we all know that we can keep improving. Yeah, <clears throat> Matt, I want to commend you on your uh, economics when you were looking at the whole farm profitability because it's been a trick of ag economists for years to say, oh, we have crop farmers and we have livestock farmers, and the livestock farmers are going to benefit by having cheap grain. And uh, the fact of the matter is that has led to the system that we have so that uh, when that livestock got cheap, the only way livestock would be raised is either using economies of scale uh, or and letting those economies of scale lead to giant feedlots like out west where the cattle are so that currently more beef is produced in those feedlots than, it, than out of the feedlots. And uh, also the cheap grain will now lead to cheap chickens so that when the consumer goes into the grocery store to buy meat, they will buy chicken instead of beef. So it's very hard to get livestock back on the farm uh, as long as the farm program allows the price of grain to be very cheap, which is was what the system is we have today. It's a fence row, fence row farming. And uh, so when you don't have the livestock on the farm, you don't really need small grains, you don't need to have bedding, et cetera, et cetera. Now I, I know people in here are able to like go against the system and I hope that's the way we can do it, but as far as the whole agricultural system, whether it's here or Brazil or anywhere else, is not going to end up the way we want it as long as everybody's thinking is, gee, cheaper, more is better. <laughs> okay? No, the farmer should, should be told that on your 320 acres, you're only going to market so much corn and soybeans, and, it, and the price is going to be a lot higher. 
so that you can't get on the phone and order all your feed for your feedlot cheaper than it would actually cost the farmer to do a good job on the farm in the first place. If, if you'll notice on your chart of where all the small grain and the pasture and everything went downhill, starting in the early 1950s, that was when the Parity farm, farm Program was destroyed. So that the intention of the program after that was to have cheaper and cheaper and cheaper feed for livestock. Okay, I'm going to go to Paul and then over to Wade. I guess I've heard it said that an ecosystem that leaks nutrients becomes a desert. And that rang a bell with me when you were describing nutrients moving out, water moving out instead of up. Does that follow what you've read or see? Yeah, as, as one of my uh, farmer friends said, <clears throat> he's trying to get water to walk, not run off his farm. And to the extent it can move upward, maybe it needs to fly. Something similar, right? So water management becomes um, intimately linked with nutrient management. And that's intimately linked with the crops. And when you begin to diversify, then you've got to think about animals. So <clears throat> I'm thinking that this area was originally a grassland with continuous living cover and deep roots. and you know, a varied topography that supported many different types of animals, including bison and elk, and other grazing ruminants. So it's not so strange to me that we would have a diversity of crops integrated with livestock, and that most of the water would be retained in these small seasonal catch ponds to evaporate, or would be moved up through the plants as transpiration water while they're growing. That seems like pretty consistent with what this ecosystem had. And that farming in that way that's diverse, that integrates crop and livestock, that mitigates the movement of water, that retains soil and allows root systems to build soil systems up, it seems like it's consistent with what this environment asks of us to live here. So I don't think you know, anything I've talked about here is particularly strange from an agronomic point of view, but what strikes me is that it's quite consistent with the way the plant soil systems evolved here with the animal life. Okay, I'm going to go to Wade, then Arlen, and then Bruce. Okay, so to go back to the uh, fall plowing, spring plowing, et cetera. Yeah. What if you were to remove tillage completely from the operation? Say you farm a lot of hills or ground that's highly erodible. So now you're mm -hmm. going to go 100% no-till. Mm -hmm. What kind of nutrient availability differences would you see since you're no longer incorporating any of that plant material into the ground you're relying well, completely so on? Well, so the soil life does a really good job incorporating some of that plant material. And the root systems of those plants, like clover and alfalfa, have a lot to do with you know, how nutrients cycle. So Margaret, you worked on no-till systems for corn into alfalfa, right? And if you go to Wisconsin, which has quite a lot of both corn silage production and uh, alfalfa production, they, on hillsides, they routinely no-till corn into alfalfa. So, you know, it can be done if you want to do it chemically and you've, you know, got your no-till thing down. I, I don't think there's any reason you can't do that. In terms of nutrient availability? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it'll be slower because the soil is colder and wetter. You're probably going to have to look at a situation where uh, you may need some starter fertilizer until you get more of that mineralization of the organic matter taking place. Uh, No-till systems in general, at least back in the old days, were said to require more nitrogen because cold, wet soils with less airspace in them were more prone to denitrification and the uh, drainage channels that develop when you don't till the soil allow more nitrogen to run through the soil. So at least back in the old days, the recommendation was that no-till systems needed a bit more nitrogen. So it wouldn't surprise me even if you were in a rotation with alfalfa that you'd probably have to put a little bit of nitrogen on it. But I haven't done the work. 
but you know, in terms of management, it can be done. Yeah. Yeah. Could you comment maybe on the uh, the benefits or the maybe the disadvantages of using winter wheat in place of the oat in this system? Maybe the ecology and the economics globally. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Yeah. So um, I have done work with corn, soybean, wheat rotations where um, the wheat is drilled, direct drilled in after soybean harvest. And the critical issue is being able to plant early enough that you get good establishment and you want to maintain a pretty good level of phosphorus because phosphorus relates to roots and phosphorus relates to winter survival. So uh, typically, Winter grain produces about 25% more per unit of land area than does spring planted grain. So if I were willing to go to a short season soybean, I think winter wheat would work well. And particularly if you're south of Highway 80, probably how south of Highway 30, maybe even south of Highway 20 now, you can grow winter wheat most years. Interceding red clover in the spring on, uh -huh. on top of the winter wheat and using it in the same exact rotation that you have? So my experience has been with frost seeding, like late February, early March, just going out with a broadcast spin spreader and putting uh, clover alfalfa seed into the grain. Works quite well. Um, winter wheat is much more competitive against interseeded legumes than spring planted grain. And alf alfalfa fares worse than does red clover. So if I were going to be somebody who was doing winter wheat fairly regularly, I'd probably be looking at red clover. You go to southern Ontario, what do you see? Corn, soybean, winter wheat often interceded with red clover. Ohio, they do that. So um, there's more corn soy in southern Ontario than there used to be, but winter wheat is very common there, and frost seeding red clover is quite common. Um, I think for establishing a high density of alfalfa plants with which to produce a long-term high yielding stand of alfalfa, I would plant spring grain, use oats as a nurse crop. I might even cut the oats um, in the boot stage, feed it as green chopper and silo. Okay, Bruce had a question. Uh, Comments and, and questions, Matt. I think this research that you're doing is some of the best agronomic research I've seen in the Midwest in years. The bad news is I don't think either you or I are going to get the Monsanto Agronomist of the Year awards, you know, in the, in the very <laughs> near future here. Um, I think one of the things that really drove this home to me this summer was when we did the field day in Nashua this summer, and we're standing at the in the uh, cut alfalfa areas between the oat plots and the corn and the soybean plots. And we could hear, because they have all the, the ground tiled, and of course this is fairly rolling ground there in Nashua at, at the Northeast Farm, mm -hmm. but you could hear the water drainage through the corn and soybean tile into the catch basins, and you couldn't hear a thing on the alfalfa or the oat plots at all. So that meant all that water mm -hmm. and all, everything else that was in that water was being retained mm -hmm. there. So uh, it's what you're doing is spot on. Congratulations. Quick question. Yeah. Um, on the chart that you had where you didn't put a value on manure, what was the there's a value on the manure, because I don't have a neighbor that's just going to let me have yeah. th three okay, tons of so, manure. Uh, we have done the calculations for manure as if it were synthetic fertilizer. And you would have to reduce the profitability about $40 per acre for the four-year rotation and about $50 per acre for the three-year rotation, because okay. you're Thank using the manure more frequently. Thank you. But that's, that's the worst case scenario where we looked at the NPK content of the manure and then we looked at what bag fertilizer was selling for and, you know, you're probably not going to pay that much for the manure because you'd use fertilizer if you, right? Okay, Luke. What about covers? Um, how do you, how, what would you hypothesize covers, cover crops would, uh, would incorporate it in this system or even like a, a separate 
rotation with like more of a cover crop focused, uh, you know, maybe for cover crop cocktails and grazing them. And so the, the the question relates to cover crops within these rotations. That yeah, could like could we know, do that? Yeah, within the rotations, and also would, would there be like a fit? Oh. Yeah, like what would be the impact of if you had a cover crop on all the corn bean, the two, th two year, three or four year? Um, what effect would that have? Yeah. And then so if you had another I rotation. Think for us, I haven't figured out how we can work cover crops in after corn because typically we're trying to dry the corn in the field and we don't have very many growing degree days left after we harvest. I mean, we could harvest it, what, 25% moisture and put it in a bin and use a lot of natural gas? Maybe not. So we're. Um, how about putting it in with an aid before? What? Putting it in before you harvest. Yeah, it's possible, but you know, this site we're averaging, our corn yields are like 194. In a good year, we're going 225. There's not a whole heck of a lot of light and moisture in the surface of the soil. When you want to seed your cover crop in August, it's just like putting it on a uh, very dry tabletop. And um, I guess my fear is that you'd be wasting a lot of cover crop seed and the aerial operation to put it on. So I think it's tough to put cover crops into corn. I think um, with soybean, you have a little bit more chance because you've got more growing degree days. You can put that cover crop in and the leaves falling off of the soybean may kind of keep it moister. Um, I guess my feeling is that if you can get a winter cereal like wheat in after soybean, you've effectively got a cover crop that pays you for harvesting. <laughs> And I like that. And you know, if you can put clover in to the wheat, you haven't compromised your ability to harvest the wheat straw and the grain. And then you've got a cover crop of red clover growing into the fall preceding your corn. So in that, in that case, I really haven't done anything special to create cover crops. And I'm getting much more continuous living cover in that system. Mm -hmm. But we had a really uh, wet right. fall, right? You, you, what'd you say? We had a wet fall. Yeah, a great fall for it. Yeah, so, and, and it was, you know, relatively warm. But I have seen years here that were so dry that I think cover crops have not fared too well. And I am a big fan of cover crops if you can get them to work. But I just think that um, given, particularly in the northern part of the state, given the small window of opportunity we have to grow things, after corn and soy and preceding corn and soy, it's really hard to get enough biomass, right? It's hard to get enough growth in the fall and growth in the spring. So in those situations, like if you're in southeast Iowa and you can fly a cover crop on and you get a lot of growth in the fall and in the spring, it's wonderful. But as you move north, those windows of opportunity are fewer. And you know the, the great thing about working with small grains is that whether you put clover or alfalfa in at the time you plant or you frost seed or you harvest in mid-July, you've got all these windows for things to grow that you don't have in most corn and soybean cropping systems. So, you know, if you didn't intercrop the oat crop and you took it off in July, you would have the opportunity to direct drill hairy vetch, maybe some of the brassicas, maybe some of the larger seeded legumes. I mean, I just, I think it creates all these opportunities to work cover crops into your system when you have summer harvested crops. Okay, uh, George and Doug have already spoken and we're running out of time, so if anybody else has a question, I would, I would, yes, all right, sorry guys. Yeah, my question is, um, what about when you fall plow? I know we're going back to it. Um, have you guys experimented with anything to kind of reduce the topsoil being blown off in the winter? Because you know, you get into some of the open areas and you can just drive down and see all the soil blown into the ditches. Yeah. Have you experimented with? No, I hear that and like I've seen it. And what I would say is that <clears throat> when we fall plow, we leave the ground rough so it's furrowed, so water infiltrates well. And remember what we're plowing, right? Perennial forage legumes with big root systems. So it's different than when you ploy, you know, I, I drove back and forth to Twin Cities several times this fall. 
um, not only did I not see very many cover crops, but I saw a lot of soybean ground that had been plowed. And there is nothing holding that soil there, okay? So it's different if you're plowing sod than if you're plowing a low residue row crop with very small root systems. And I, I don't disagree with you that you could get yourself into some problems with wind erosion, okay? And, and I'm not telling you that the system is perfect. It has its flaws and it could be improved. But I think that physically the structure of the soil is different than when you're plowing row crops. And, um, you know, I wouldn't want to finish the tillage operations in the fall. I want to leave it rough, allow water to drain in. Um, but I think there's enough root material, particularly when you're plowing late, right, because you don't get a lot of decomposition. So th there's something holding it. It's not perfect, but it's better than soybean residue. Okay, oh, got a new one. <laughs> I got I to gotta be fair here. Um, the the soil loss potential uh, the, that that uh, trial I guess so that, or the, that modeling that was a component of it. Rick Cruz has some great modeling on a larger scale right. along those lines. Um, this is a, a hypothetical, but is there somebody that you know that might be able to do this to combine the information that you have and the information that Rick has yeah. and so run scenarios Rick of if we have 10% of farmers in Iowa adopt a four-year rotation on their yeah. land, what would that do for yeah. long-term pr yeah. productivity and then soil loss and related effects? Okay, so I'll, so I'll say two things. The guy who builds the erosion models with Rick is the guy I work with. The second thing is that Rick Cruz <coughs> works with a daily erosion project, and what they have explicitly tried to do is add to those estimates of sheet and rail erosion, what's called ephemeral gully erosion. The stuff that you see when you drive from the roadside that cuts a ditch a little, or sometimes not so little, <coughs> gully through the field, and then you smooth out with a disc before you plant. Okay, that, that probably is about half the soil erosion that's taking place due to rainfall in Iowa. And that's not factored into all the USDA estimates of erosion. And that's why Cruz's group has been trying to bring that to the forefront and make people more aware that the amount of soil movement and soil loss taking place on fields is probably double what we're being told that, you know, roughly we're being told now it matches the T level of four to five tons an acre. Well, what if it's 10 tons an acre? Okay. So um, I think that uh, you would need to add additional conservation practices to some of these rotation systems, like grass waterways, you know, conservation buffer strips, terraces, whatever fits your system, right? So rotation alone is probably not enough in the new high rainfall regime that we're currently experiencing. But I think it's a very powerful tool. So there is a very uh, illustrative experiment that was done at Sanborn Field in Missouri, okay? that they grew continuous corn, or they had bare ground, or they had continuous sod, or they had a rotation of corn, oats, and clover for 100 years. And they looked at the difference in topsoil depth and calculated the difference in erosion rate as a fu function of those different forms of land use. And obviously, um, where you do more tillage, you lose a lot of soil. And <clears throat> the rotation plots were intermediate between all grass and all bare soil, and they were better than continuous corn. So, you know, for 100 years of cropping, you can see the effect. Okay, we got time for one more, and George is just, is just flagging me down. So I'm gonna give it to George here. I just wanna say, your system is really important for restoring our biodiversity. I've had red clover on the farm now two years in a row, this last year, 78 acres. And from the time I harvested my oats, I had you know, like hundreds of thousands of monarch butterflies coming to feed on those blooms. And uh, man, they just, I, I, well, I, actually, I was thinking when I was out there with those butterflies, I'm looking around at all the other fields, and yeah. I'm, I'm thinking like, well, where do they eat otherwise? I have no idea, because there's mm -hmm. no blooms out there for them to eat. So the amazing thing about wildlife is if you provide habitat, it shows up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, well, we are at time. Let's thank Matt very much. That was excellent.